Hello, and thank you for joining me for another demonstration. Today, I'm going to be using the Ansible Automation platform to build custom execution environments. So um, I'm going to use the tool to build things to then put back into the tool. So it's a little bit meta, um, but it actually keeps things a little bit simpler. So if you're unaware, I've created a blog post. I'm showing you um, kind of start to finish how to create your execution environments and how to even install private automation hub and get them in there. So that's what I'm going to be doing here. Uh, not that portion. <clears throat> I'm not installing the private automation hub. I'm going to assume you've already got that done. What I'm going to be doing is taking the execution environment uh, uh, template files. So you've got to build these manually. Uh, that's the only portion I'm going to be kind of manually doing. So once I have those built, I'm going to fire up the automation for that particular execution environment. It's going to go, it's going to build it, and then it's going to install it in the private automation hub as well as install it in my Ansible automation platform. So I'm going to start at the start with the configuration files themselves. So taking a look here, I've got uh, in this folder structure, I've got root EE, Azure EE supported, EE as in executed, or rather execution environment. And I'm uh, starting with the uh, supported base image. So really I've created three files here. The context gets built once the uh, the uh, runner happens, you know, it, it processes and it creates that context file, the Ansible Builder does. And uh, some of the base file, you've got requirements.yml. This is where I'm specifying the collections to be used. And in this uh, Azure one, I've got Azure.Azure .azure collection, but I've also got AWX.AWX, which is a community supplied one. Uh, this allows me to more easily uh, manipulate things inside of the uh, automation controller. So I'm going to grab that and package it in here. Uh, next, we have the requirements.txt file. This is going to be all of the uh, Python requirements. Uh, as you can see, the Azure one uh, requires a lot of different things. And then uh, down here, here are the ones for the uh, AWX uh, collection. And so how do I find these? Inside of the collections themselves, generally they have a requirement.txt file. And so I just took the contents of both of those, pasted them in here, and Bob's your uncle. So the last file I have to use is the execution-environment.yml. And this is where I'm actually uh, setting the kind of the configuration file for Ansible Builder, the Ansible-Builder binary. That binary is going to run. It's going to look at this, and it's going to use all of these pieces to uh, compile the execution environment. I'm also using this file as kind of a variables file. So I'm going to be pulling information out of here for use in my playbooks, right? So I've got my version number. I've got my um, base image it's going to be built from. And this is going to be pulled straight from registry.redhat.io. It's going to go there and grab the newest version. And so the supported one <clears throat> contains all of the supported collections by uh, Red Hat directly. And so there's about 10 or 15 uh, supported collections inside of there that are already going to be uh, ready to go for me to use. So I'm just going to use that one, repackage it, add some extra stuff to it. So for instance here, I've got version 1.0.2 uh, installed. So if I pop into my private automation hub, I go to my execution environment section. I'm going to find my Azure supported. You can see it's already in here. I've already created it. I'm going to go to activity. You can see it shows all of the various things I've done, right? It started at 1.0.1 uh, and then 1.0.2 eventually. If I take a look at images, you can see I just changed the version number on these while I was doing testing. So they're ultimately the same one, but you can see each version uh, over time as it's going to you know, be created and populated in here. It'll show up in this list. So I'm currently at 1.0.2, so I'm going to edit it. So I'm at 1.0.3, right? I'm going to change that version. I'm going to go ahead and save that file so that it's ready for execution. So now I'm going to pop into my Ansible Automation platform. I've already created a job template based off of the uh, playbook we're going to take a look at. Build execution environment. And I'm going to go ahead and just launch that one. That way, you know, as it processes, we can come back and take a look. So I wanted to quickly jump over to the playbook. Again, all these playbooks are public. They're available for you to, to get in here and utilize however you see fit. So I thought I would just go over this really quickly. So I'm building all of this off of my 
controller server, right? So you have to have a server that you're actually going to be running the Ansible dash builder executable off of. And so I'm using the, uh, the controller server itself. So I've got that here in the host section, aap.gregsol.com. So <clears throat> I also have some additional credentials required, right? So connecting to my controller, I'm populating that with some generic custom credentials. So inside of Ansible, I can create a custom credential. I'm doing air quotes. I know you can't see it, uh, but it allows me to prompt um, like when the credential section prompt and create credentials of any kind, pulling any information. And the good part about it is like this password field, I can specify it as a password inside that custom credential and it'll obfuscate this information. And we'll see that in just a minute, but it'll, um, it'll set no log for those entries right there. So I can still see the entirety of the play output, but that one section where it would show the password, it has it set to no log, which is a nice little feature. So here, uh, the base EE, that's where I'm setting the base execution environment I'm be building from. You can see it's commented out because I'm actually pulling that from that um, uh, execution environment, uh, execution environment YAML file. That's what it is. So it's going and it's pulling that information there. It's also pulling the version from that execution environment file. So those are both grayed out. What I do have specified in here is on my uh, builder server the path to where the execution environments live and then which execution environment we're creating right there as well as the uh, host name for the private automation hub that i'm going to be connecting to next i have right here the automation um, credential or rather the private automation hub credential it's going to be utilizing so um, i actually got to do a little bit of a lookup process uh, over here in just a moment. Here's the credentials for private automation hub again. <clears throat> These are going to be set up using custom credentials. That way it obfuscates the password piece. Um, and I actually create custom credentials. So I have just like a generic uh, one, generic two. That way I can pump in a lot of different generic passwords and I can just reuse that custom credential over and over for lots of different things. Jumping into the task section here. First thing I'm doing is I am grabbing that execution environment file. So I'm actually fetching it from the remote server and I'm pulling it into a local container. Interesting thing about containers is the destination path usually turns out looking pretty crazy. Um, let's take a look at the automation controller and I will scroll up to the top execution environment here it is this is where it grabs it and if i take a look at this destination section right here this is the path that it saves it into runner project execution environment aap right so it's it's very long and complex and i don't want to have to type all that out so what i do is inside of this playbook i save that as a uh, variable i just register it as a variable and then i reference that so i'm doing include variables so i'm basically just including that file that i pulled uh, to uh, grab all of those variables in there. And uh, for the, uh, uh, again, for the destination, I'm just pulling it out of the variable registered here. So I don't have to like keep track of that crazy long path. Next, I'm going to be setting some base variables. So I'm going to be doing a lot of set facts off of those ones I pulled out of the configuration file. And really, that's my base execution environment and my new version. After that, I'm going to grab a list of the EEs that. Uh, currently exists on that server. I'm just doing a Podman image list. What I want to make sure is that that base one actually exists. So in this version, I'm just sitting out, a, I'm spitting out a message. If it doesn't exist, it says, hey, you need to install the missing execution environment. And in a future revision, it's actually going to reach out and go and download it to the local server. So uh, that will kind of complete most of the steps for me. Uh, let's see, uh, building the uh, build process. So this is where I actually connect to the um, Ansible, the AAP server, and I'm spitting out the uh, command to do the builder. So it's actually going to build the, uh, the new execution environment. Now I'm going to push that to the container registry. Next, I'm going to, um, in my credential, or rather my controller, I had to do a couple of interesting things. So the first interesting thing is I have to pull a list of all the credentials. Then I have to loop through that looking for um, the one that uh, matches the name I specified up here, right? So by default, it's going to be Automation Hub Container Registry. It actually wants the ID as opposed to the name. So I'm specifying loop through this and find that, uh, that name 
and save the ID. That way, when I say, hey, actually add it in, uh, you know, use the ID as opposed to the name and everything is happy, hunky-dory. After I uh, actually find the ID, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have to pull all of the execution environments and I'm going to loop through and see if mine currently exists, right? So it's really just checking to see, hey, does this name for this execution environment that I've created in, in mine, Azure uh, EE supported does exist, uh, but if it's brand new, it won't exist. So uh, after I check it and find it, I will check to see what the ID of, uh, rather what the ID is of the existing execution environment, if it does exist. And we'll use that just momentarily. So if it didn't exist, I just go ahead and create it really quick. Bob's your uncle, really simple. If you check right here, I'm just giving it a name, giving it the image it's going to utilize, description, credential, or uh, that's the, uh, the ID that we had to loop through and find, and then pull, I like to use missing. So if that execution environment doesn't exist, it will go and it will uh, pull it from the private automation hub if it's already there upon uh, automation executions, then it just leaves it. Uh, next, we're going to pop down to right here, which is the very last section that says, hey, if the execution environment already did exist, let's just go through and do an update. And that's why I have to have the ID. Uh, it actually wants you to specify the ID and then put all of the information here that I'm going to be updating and then you know, do a, a quick put and it saves it. So why is the missing so important? One is it's more... Uh, rather on the pull type. Why is missing important to me? One, it's um, more efficient. That way it's not pulling every single time. But it also appears uh, that uh, if I go in here and I update the uh, version number of the uh, execution environment, right? So, so now I'm actually running three, right? Before it was 1.0.2, now it's 1.0.3. I've updated uh, that in my private automation hub or rather in my controller. So if I pop into my controller, Looks like the job's completed successfully. I will go into my execution environments. I will look for Azure right here, supported version. And I can see it's now set to 1.0.3. So it's gone through the process where it builds it, pushes up to private automation hub, and then it connects into my platform and it set it. So now that it sees 1.0.3, whenever this uh, uh, controller fires a piece of automation, it's going to look in here and it's going to see 1.0.3 uh, is uh, the image that needs to be utilized. It's in its container register, or rather it's in its, um, in its local storage for that container. It'll see, oh, well, you're 1.0.2, so it should connect to my private automation hub and pull the new version down. So it's a little bit more efficient on utilization. So let me pop into the job section here. Or rather, uh, let me pop into my private ed automation hub first. I'll do a quick, quick uh, refresh on this. And I can see now it's got 1.0.3 tag on this exact same image. If I look at the activity log, I can see 1.0.3 was added today, eight minutes ago. It did the push. Uh, so uh, this job did execute correctly and cleanly. So all the steps followed through just fine all the looping everything completed just fine so you can see if i actually needed to make a modification to my execution environment all i have to do is come in here make a change to the file fire it off you know i in my playbook i can just um as extra variables i can change the execution environment it needs to uh, adjust to i could also do a survey and allow my users to uh, be prompted for which execution environment change they could paste that in and it will go through the process and install it on all my controllers and Bob Drunkle, right? Like I'm done. Like I, I really don't have to touch it anymore. I guess if you guys have any uh, guys, gals, or everybody in between, if you have any questions or comments, please fire my way. I hope this demonstration made things a little bit more clear, a little bit uh, simpler. I know I try and get through a lot of information quickly, uh, but uh, thank you and we'll see you next time.